the rescue mission. Genesis chapter 14, verses 1 to 24. The greatest rescue mission in the history of the world took place in the pivotal time of human history. BC, before Christ, AD, Anno Domini, the year of the Lord, when our Lord Jesus Christ entered human history, when He took on human flesh to become man, to live as man, born of a virgin, He was on this rescue mission for all mankind since time immemorial his work would be to save them from the destruction of the second death what is the second death the second death is the eternal death the second death is the death that of god's judgment in hellfire after the first death, which is the physical death that all of us have to go through. Jesus Christ was on that rescue mission. When He hung on the cross, He bore the sins of the world. Your sins and my sins, He bore them. As God, He represented God. And as man, he represented man. He was the God-man. And he was the one who would make reconciliation for sinners so that sinful man may be reconciled to a holy God, to partake the blessing of the divine nature that is promised to us in Christ and we thank the Lord that before the Lord Jesus Christ came it was prophesied of his coming in that pivotal moment of history but 2,000 years before that we saw the man Abram in our story given here in Genesis chapter 12 where we just began studying when God called a man to enact this rescue mission for the souls of mankind and it will culminate in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and his coming to the land of Canaan by the call of God was by the providence of God that he would be called to sojourn in a very strategic part of the earth, the strategic point that is among three continents, Europe, Asia, and Africa. The land of Canaan, a very strategic piece of real estate that God has asked Abram to dwell in. And our story tells us that he has come that long way, 1,200 kilometers, all the way to the land of Canaan to dwell there. And last week we saw that God reiterated the promise that He will be given the promise to inherit this land, this piece of real estate that God has asked Him to see with his own eyes while well, he was in the central 
uh, high ground of Canaan and he was able to see northward, eastward, westward, southward. And there the Lord said to him that this is the land that will be given to you and your descendants for a possession. Did Abraham coveteth, covet after this land? Well, no. God was the one who said he would give it to him. But did he truly inherit the land? Well, he did not inherit the land. In the <clears throat> lifetime of his sojourn there, uh, the land was in no, in, in no wise his, but promised to him by God. And he claimed it by faith. So God said to him, you recall last week, Arise and walk. Where you walk, this land would be promised to you and your descendants. And Abraham, by faith, believed God. And therefore, he made that journey. He walked to the land, believing that this is the promise of God for him. And we saw in the book of Hebrews that he believed God and understood a greater promise. The book of the writer of Hebrews says, For he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He was looking for a land that God has promised him that he would possess by faith. Walking with God is a journey that is by faith, not by sight. And it's interesting that he was there sojourning together with his brother's son, the man called Lot. Lot was someone who has been enticed by the things of this world. When the family went down to Egypt, disobeying the will of God, Lot became acquainted to the glittering goal of this world. And he began to feel uh, last towards the possessions of the material things of this world. And that last would become so great that he would one day say to his uncle, Abraham, that he will not want to sojourn with him anymore in this little place. I have greater ambition for more gain in this life. And therefore, he separated himself from uh, uncle and he began to uh, chart his own life according to the last of his own eyes. So he saw the lush plains that was in the south, near the Dead Sea, near to Sodom and Gomorrah. Those were the places that were given there in our book. The five cities that is in the south, the city of Sodom, you see in verse 2, the city of Gomorrah, the city of Etma, the city of Zeboim, the city of Zoah. Lush plains, beautiful. But the people in the land were very wicked. They had no morals. They were men who were seeking 
to violate one another, to cheat one another, to take one another's possessions. Well, Lot was mixed up with such company. And Abram, on the other hand, was separated. He was living a nomadic life, just himself with his family, away from all the entanglements of this life. And lo and behold, when you look, take a real look at the world, you would see that it is a world that is run by evil, run by greed, run by covetousness. So there were five cities that were in the south. They were actually tributaries to four great international coalition of kings that is in the north. Right? Verse 1 of our text tells us that there were four uh, kings in the north. Those were the uh, possessors right, of large estates. The first right, is called Kedo Laume, the king of Elam. Where is Elam? Elam is modern-day Iran, a big piece of real estate. And then there is also <clears throat> the land of Shina, verse 14 and verse chapter 14 and verse 1. That's the land of Iraq. That's where uh, Ur was, that's where Abraham came from. So there was the land of modern-day Iraq, modern-day Iran. And then there are two more kings there, Tidal, king of nations, and Amraf, uh, and Ariok, king of Elessa. These were the kings that occupied the land of modern-day Turkey modern-day Turkey. So if you look at the map of the Mesopotamia, right, uh, up north, you would be able to see these are huge piece of real estates. Four great kings who have made these five uh, little city states in the south their tri tributary states. In other words, they would give tribute to this international coalition of four kings up north. And this was the case for 12 years. But in the 13th year, what happened? Well, our text tells us in, um, in uh, Genesis chapter 14 and verse 4. Twelve years they served Kedo Laome, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. So there was a conflict that took place. Right? That international coalition, the alliance was uh, disrupted, and therefore there was war arising, and the kings of the north gather themselves together and our text tells us that they march south and they have already taken the land all the way down from Damascus all the way down to Canaan and they are all the way down to the southern part where the five cities were and there in the south lay the family of Lot 
was listening to someone who was sharing about the terrible, uh, frightening experiences of war. So this person said, you know, the people of God trust God. And the people of God are taken care of by their God. Do you believe in miracles that God is able to take care of His people? Well, I tell you that we were believers and there was danger in the family. Father or grandfather was with uncle and his four sons. They were all put on the truck held by the, the Japanese soldiers and they will be hurled off for extermination. And there, grandfather said to uncle, well, he gave a plea to the enemy and said, will you allow him, he's a weak man, to come down from the truck? And so uncle was released. And when uncle was released, he asked his four sons, also come down. And the enemy allowed them. And so she, it was related how they were all able to escape in that one moment. And she said, it is said that what if, what if they were all trucked off? Well, we'll never see them again. How frightening it is. Uh, we understand the terrible uh, atrocities and the tragedies of war. Well, it was wartime in Canaan, and Lot was taken captive by the enemy. He and his family and all the five kings, they were defeated. Our text tells us uh, uh, this story, verse 5. And in the fourteenth year came Kedor Laomer and the kings that were with him and smote the Raphaims and the Astaroth and the Kanaims and the Zuzims and Ham and Emims in Shaver, Kiratayim. These are the places further up north in Canaan. And the Horites in the Mount Seir and unto El Paran, which is by the wilderness. And they returned and came unto En Mishpat, which is Kadesh, and they smote all the country of the Amalekites and the Amorites and dwelt in Haz Hazizon Tamar. Well, these are all the land that is up north. So the coalition uh, combed through the land and uh, they came down south. And there, verse 8 of our text, and there went out the king of Sodom. That's where Lot stayed. And the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Edma, and the king of Zeboim, and the king of Zeba, Bila, same of Zoa, they joined battle in the vale of Sidim, that's near the Dead Sea. And so the kings fought five against four, four against five. Verse 10, And the vale of Sidim was full of slime peat, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there and, there, and they that remained fled to the mountain, and they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah. The spoils of war. In the time of warfare, the stronger will oppress the weaker. And what is the spoil? of the victory, well, all the gains of war. Well, this is the result of the fallenness of mankind. When men would coveteth after each other's belongings. First Timothy 6 verse 10 tells us, 
For the love of money is the root of all evil, which some coveteth after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Why do countries invade one another in order to take the resources of the other nation, in order to gain access to resources, whether it's human resources, whether it's natural resources. The greed of men and Lot was entangled with this kind of a life. When we choose to want to get gain, the gain of this world, instead of trusting in God, we shift our trust from the God that made heaven and earth, that made all things, to the God of gold, you realize that all that glitters is not gold. The pot of gold at the end of the rainbow was never really there. And you see Lot having thought he would get gain by his endeavor to stay and trade in the city of Sodom, found himself losing everything that he had and taken captive by the enemy. And it was at that time that Abram found out concerning the plight of Lot. And it is interesting that when a man is walking with God, he f takes time to understand the will of God and he keeps himself in the will of God, living a life of holiness, separated from the disease, the filth of gain, this world's gain, there is peace. This was Abraham's life. This was Abram's life, nomadic life that he had. He would lead his family daily, gather his family for worship, and contended that this will be the life for him living in Canaan, knowing that God has promised him and his descent in this land and yet never really possessing it. This was Abraham's life. If you look at it from the worldling's point of view, he seemed to be a very... Uh, a man that is out of his senses, going against the grind of society, he would not want to have gain. Right? He let Lot choose the large plains. He was willing to settle for less. What was his motivation? Well, he was a man who is sufficient in himself because God was with him. Do you have that kind of a sufficiency that you enjoy in your heart that you have God with you and that you know that He will take care of you and that whatever lot in life that He gives to you you know that it is the best for you and you are willing to trust Him you are willing to as it were settle down, settle to be contented with all that God has given you. This was Abram's life. God was with him. God blessed and protected him with his peace. 
he was walking in the center of God's will. But for Lot, he was a believer. He ought to have been with Abraham, receiving and enjoying the covenant blessings that God has given through them. But Lot was enticed by the things of this world. So 1 Timothy 6 verse 10 says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which some coveteth after. They have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. What was the sorrow that Lot was experiencing now? Well, he was... He lost all his possessions and now he is taken captive. God gave this knowledge of the captivity of Lot to Abram, verse 13. And there came one that escaped and told Abram the Hebrew, from, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, the brother of Eshcol, brother of Enah, and these were confederate with Abram. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his house, 318, and pursued them unto Den. Den is up north. When he heard about his brother's situation, what did he do? He gathered all his household servants and he says, we are going to make a journey to rescue my nephew. What was he doing? You know, he was up against an international coalition of trained soldiers, all of which powerful men. What was Abram doing? Well, God was with him. The Spirit of God was with him. He knew that this was his nephew. This was a man of God that has, been, has gone astray and that he needed help. He was not looking at the size of the army that was before him, but he was looking at the importance of the task that God has given to him. And what did he do? Well, he was a man who seek God and appropriated the resources of God. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28 to 31. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28 to 31. If you talk about... Uh, miraculous victory, a victory, an impossible victory against an enemy, this is it. How did Abram manage this feat? Isaiah 40 verse 28 says, Has thou not known, has thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, to them that have no might. He increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And they shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. So Abram gathering his 318 servants were given special unction of strength to pursue the enemy, to rescue Lot. How the Lord grant them the needful strength to overcome the enemy. You remember the story of Gideon? How the Lord asked him by a small number of men to overcome the mighty army of the Midianites? 
the Lord said to him, when he started to draft the man, too many, too many. The Lord used only a small number, a couple of hundreds, to defeat a 20,000 army of the Midianites. How did it happen? God provided the strategy. God provided the means, the strengths. And when you have God with you, you have the strength of omnipotence with you. And this, the people of God must know that as we do the will of God, as we obey God and seek His grace to do, fulfill His purpose, He grants us the strength to do the impossible. And so, Abram was able to gather up his servants and was able to go and pursue the enemy. Verse 15, And he divided himself against them and he and his servants by night. It was a battle not by day but by night. So in the darkness, in the stealth of the night, he gained the victory. And he smote them and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left side of Damascus. Damascus is really very far up, right? After Lebanon uh, is Syria, and that's the capital, that's Damascus. So he went all the way up, and he was able to bring back all the goods. And again, his brother Lot, and his goods, and the women, and the people. How did he win that victory? Well, the book of Lamentations, chapter 3, verse 25 to 26 says, The Lord is good unto them that wait for him. To the soul that seek him, it is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. So Abram must have taken time to seek the Lord. The Lord showed him, gave him the go-ahead, said to him to pursue and what to do, what would be the battle plan. So this was one of the greatest, you may say, uh, <clears throat> military expedition uh, that took place in the early years of uh, the forefathers of the Hebrew people. The first battle, how it was won, God was with them. It was in the will of God that they would have the victory. Was he afraid of the enemy? The enemy was so great, so powerful. But he had God with him. This is all that matters, dear friends. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 8, Paul says in his missionary journeys. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. The problems can be great. The trials can be overwhelming. But for the people of God, you have the Lord with you the Lord will see to it that He will help you. Christ is able to suckle the tempted. Hebrews 2 verse 18, uh, do you see it in our uh, weekly? For, he, for in that He Himself has suffered being tempted, He is able to suckle them that are tempted. He is able to help. He is able to come to the assistance of those who call out to him. You remember the disciples were in a boat. Two times they faced a terrible storm. One time Jesus was with them in the boat. One time Jesus was outside the boat. But both times 
the Lord delivered them. In the most critical period, Peter shouted, Lord, save! Lord, save! And what did the Lord do? Immediately, Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him. Dear friends, we have, by the mercy of God, come to know the Lord Jesus Christ the Son of God, the one who created the heavens and the earth, the one who we can trust to take care of us through life. This was Abraham's God. And we thank the Lord that we know him. We thank the Lord that we can trust him. And he is the one that will take care of us and we who are God's children we may safely trust him and follow him and obey him day by day moment and moment in life what is the lesson here turn with me to Hebrews 13 verse 5 and we will conclude Hebrews 13 and verse 5. It says here, Let your conversation, let your life be without covetousness. In other words, trust God. Do not go for anything that is out of the will of God. Be content with such things as ye have. Be content. In other words, your lot in life is no accident. God tells you that this is the best for you. And the Lord wants us to see and learn. Abraham understood. That's why he was willing to stay as a wanderer, and living a nomadic life. He was not uh, willing to compete with Lot. He allowed him to have the large land, he knew that if he had God with him, the Lord would take care of him. And you can see that the Lord prospered Abram. He had no lack. The Lord took care of him. And so, for verse 13, verse 5, Hebrews 13, verse 5 says, as he, have, as he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. This is the secret of life with God. You have Him with you. You walk in the center of His will, obeying Him, following His commandments, walking with Him. That's where life finds its greatest blossoming. And you find that as you live that life of contentment with God, you would be able to see that there are those around you facing problems, like Abraham seeing Lot. And God will give you the spiritual strength, the resources, the grace, to extend a helping hand to the people around you. As you walk with God, as you are contented with your lot in life, as you bless Him and you worship Him, ah, you'll find that it is great strength. And God will bring people your way. And you realize, oh, your eyes will be open to see the needs of the people around you so that you would be also given the wisdom how to help the people around you. This was the life of Christ when he entered human history. Our text in Matthew chapter 9 tells us Jesus went about all cities and villages 
teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep without a shepherd. As you live that life with God, you receive the fullness of God in your life. The divine nature, you are a partaker of it. God lives through you and in and through you. The power of God. And you would be given the spiritual eyes to see the needs of the people around you. Who is in trouble? Who needs help? And God will also give you the spiritual resources, the physical resources that you need to help. This is what we see in the rescue mission. The man contended by himself with God and God showed him a picture of the mission field and God energized him with the power to go about doing good so our Lord Jesus says to his disciples the harvest truly is plenteous but the laborers are few pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest so how can we be a laborer for God? We must first put our own house in order. We must be able to take hold of our own lives. We must rid ourselves of the covetousness. And when we are contented living that life with God, that's where God will start showing you the needs of the people around you. And that's where God will also energize you with the power to effect some good, to impact the life of men and women for eternity. So dear friends, what is the best thing that you can give to someone? as a child of God. I submit to you, the best thing that you can give to someone is to give them the gospel. That they may be reconciled to God. <coughs> that they may find forgiveness of sins. They have, may have find the heart problem resolved. Ah, that's the greatest thing that you can do for someone. And when the person finds peace with God, that's where that person would be useful. To the people around us, may God help us. May God strengthen us by His grace and use us in these last days to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. So let us work on our own lives so that we may be at peace and live in a life of holiness before God and God opening the way we move forward as He energizes and open the way for us. May God help us. Let us pray. Father, we thank Thee for Thy grace, thank Thee for Thy word. Strengthen us by Thy mercy and use us to be instruments of righteousness for Thy own namesake. This I pray with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen.